Bien, como bien todos sabrán, eh, vamos a tener el lujo de, de escuchar a Dan Milman. Él es el protagonista, eh, con unos años más, de el, la película que tuvimos ocasión de ver el, el pasado día. Como introducción, eh, sí me gusta compartirles muy brevemente, porque el protagonista es él y es a quien vamos a exprimir, en cómo surgió esta, este contacto. En cierta ocasión, José Ramón, hace unos meses, me llamó y me dijo, Juan, tengo a la persona posiblemente que más quieras ver en este mundo. Yo le pregunté si era Obama, me dijo que no. Le pregunté si era Mónica Bellucci, también me dijo que no. Y finalmente me dijo que era Dan Milman. Y le dije, yes, cierto. Para mí Dan Milman es, sinceramente, la persona que veo dos veces a la semana, a veces dos veces al día, porque esta película la utilizo mucho en, en, a nivel profesional. ¿no? ¿Qué importancia tiene Dan Milman para, para nosotros? Yo creo que la película y su vida... Y, y su libro, sobre todo su libro, eh, habla de felicidad, habla de superar miedo, habla de vivir en el presente, habla de superarse a sí mismo y, sobre todo, de desarrollar nuestro potencial. Hace tiempo, yo creo que todos nosotros queríamos, en algún momento de nuestra vida, cambiar el mundo, ¿no? Y descubrimos, para bien o para mal, que no podemos cambiar el mundo, pero sí podemos cambiar mundos, podemos cambiar personas, podemos cambiar individuos, ayudándoles a desbloquear creencias, a descubrir autoestima, y a descubrir ese potencial que tiene. Dan Milma es un forjador de eso y creo que es hora de ceder la palabra y que nos cuente y nos transforme a todos nosotros. Dan, todo tuyo. Gracias. Thank you, Juan. And uh, perdóname, I'm going to go closer to the audience. I would sit in your laps if I could. Uh, bienvenidos. Welcome. I could not start speaking until I acknowledge and thank Jose and uh, the team and the staff of the campus de Excelencia, uh, Excelencia and also the sponsors and the government of Spain to help make this gathering possible. So with that, let me start by sharing uh, a quotation. A man named Stanislaw Lech wrote a book while he was in a concentration camp during World War II. And he said, I wanted to tell the world just one word. Unable to do that, I became a writer. I wanted to tell the world just one word too. Maybe it was peace, love, or happiness. But I was unable as well. So I became a writer, 14 books. The challenge today is to condense much of that into what I can share today. I'd like to start by describing something about what I call the way of the peaceful warrior, Guerrero Pacifico. Um, it's about living with a peaceful heart, but also the acknowledgement that we need a warrior spirit at times to be effective in life because it takes courage to live in this world and it takes courage to love in this world. In my view, only the most courageous souls come down to this particular planet to learn. And to give a better, uh, I'd like to speak about the peaceful warrior's way in the context of the gathering here, this distinguished company. Um, I'm here to voice, to give voice to your aspirations Uh, and to honor those and to support them, to say what I can. Now, someone came up to me once after a seminar I presented and said, Dan, I feel so inspired. And I said, don't worry, it will pass. Because it does. Inspiration comes and goes, motivation rises and falls. So I'm not really here to inspire you or to motivate you. I'm, rather, I'm going to sow some seeds. Uh, instead, I'm going to offer reminders of what you already know at deeper levels. But we tend to forget about our lives. Because many of you here, uh, younger people, older people, are here in a position of leadership, wanting to lead the way to be on the cutting edge of positive change and solve many of the problems in the world today. So I'm going to speak to that. But let me provide a context, because some of you saw the movie, and I want to explain how I came from being a self-absorbed young athlete, 
years ago to a self-absorbed writer and teacher today. Um, I used to focus on talent for sports because I was an athlete and a coach at a major university at Stanford. Uh, so I focused on, can we develop more talent to learn faster and easier and rise to higher levels in the realm of sport, which had applications for music or any other form of training? And I found that there were certain physical qualities that we could develop to actually help us to learn faster and easier. Qualities like strength and flexibility, uh, coordination, rhythm, timing, balance, and reflex speed. So when I was coaching the, the athletes, we didn't just focus on skills right away. We focused on building a foundation of talent to prepare them. And my theories did work out well in practice. My team there went from one of the lowest, one of the weakest teams in the, uh, the league to one of the top three teams in the United States. And I trained the top US Olympian. But my interest, it didn't seem like enough. There was something I was here to do that seemed larger. And so my interest shifted from building talent for sport into asking what qualities can we develop physical, emotional, psychological, to help us create more talent for living, talent for relationships, for marriage, for children, for finances and careers, for getting more clear, for learning to communicate more clearly, to be more authentic, to live in the present. Kind of life skills we don't usually learn in school. And that search led me around the world, studying with various mentors, some people imagine that I just stumbled into a, a gas station and uh, learned a lot from this old man, and then I share it. But there were more mentors, more influences, and uh, decades of preparation. So it ended up being a way I call an approach to living called the way of the peaceful warrior. That's a little bit about my story and what brought me here. But I now need to acknowledge your story. You have a story as well, and that's your treasure. It's not just that you have a story, you are a story in the making, and you never know what the next chapter is going to be. I think an archetypal incident in our global culture was the Berlin Wall. It was there, then it was gone. Soviet Russia was a power house, and then it changed. Things can change like that. Some surprising development. So we need to stay open to that. But I do want to acknowledge your story. Every one of you here, whatever your life looks like from the outside, you've faced adversity. You've overcome challenges in your own life. Now, I could be wrong about that. Maybe your life's been easy, but if I can check it out, would you please raise your hand if you've experienced physical, emotional, or mental pain? Could I see a show of hands? I thought so, and some of you just don't want, want to raise your hand, that's okay. Um, we've all experienced that, and you know what, I'll bet because of that pain, because of the difficulties you've faced in your life, in relationships, and in self-doubt, internal difficulties, and external ones, because of that, you're probably a little stronger now than you were, and maybe a little wiser, and maybe even more compassionate for having gone through those difficulties. So we've all shared this. See, I've never seen adversity without hidden gifts of strength, wisdom, and perspective. So I do want to acknowledge your story. Um, it makes a big, big difference what each of us can do here. I had no idea what I would be doing when I was the age of some of you here. I had impulses. I, I liked to write. I didn't know what I'd ever write about. And I liked to share with other people. And I see you there now. You know, many of you are in your 20s. They call them the trying 20s because we try this, then we try that until we find out how we can exert the right leverage. Now, let me call in a broader context right now. Um, as you know, most peoples on the planet today, their business is struggling to survive, to get enough food for themselves and their families. 
Even though India and China, other countries are evolving and becoming more developed, there's still vast numbers of people in the countryside struggling. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, once said to a starving man, God is bread. So that is their proper business, to survive. But many of us who've been fortunate enough to grow up in a relatively developed world, that we don't have to usually worry day to day about whether we're going to get enough to eat to survive. Those of us who've experienced some success, maybe our parents are fairly well off, they have a car, a house, um, and they've done fairly well for themselves, and maybe some of us have too. And yet, we notice we're not happy yet. There's a saying that the, the lesson is simple, the student is complicated. We not, maybe our physical circumstances aren't so difficult, but we create so many obstacles for ourselves. We complicate things. The writer Mark Twain once wrote, I've had many troubles in my life, most of which never happened. Again, because of what's going on in our heads and the filters with, with, through which we see the world. So many of us have become a little disillusioned with the pure Western solution to happiness, which is the extroverted, uh, expansive, achievement-oriented, success-driven, uh, go-for-the-gold, um, money and, and experiences and status. That's the Western way, and it's supposed to achieve happiness. When we succeed enough, we achieve enough. But when we become disillusioned, what we tend to do is the pendulum swings from the Western solution to the Eastern solution. And we say, ah, the answer is, it's not. We need detachment from the things of the ego. We need detachment from money and possessions and so on. And what we need to do is find all our answers inside. That's the mystic's answer. Well, I've been to the East and I've met some grumpy monks. Um, not all of them, of course, but the point is I have friends who meditate all the time and they've learned something about the nature of their minds through that practice. It's an exercise. But often their finances are unstable, their relationships are not too stable because they're doing so much inner work they've ignored what they need to do in the world around them. So what I call the peaceful warrior's way and that's really describing all of us. Every one of us is a peaceful warrior in training. We're on the same journey together here. What I mean by that, it's a calling for balance. Balance of East and West, taking the best of both worlds. Balance of science and mysticism. Embracing both faith and reason. The left brain and the right brain. Flesh and and spirit. So it's an all-encompassing approach using perennial wisdom. All the wisdom has been expressed. You can go back to ancient times, the ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, Lao Tzu and Chuang Tzu in China, you know, Plato, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus. Uh, in every culture has had its sages who've expressed wisdom. But every new generation needs new voices to express that wisdom in a way that makes sense and is accessible to modern men and women. I'm just one of those many voices. So what are we doing here? We're here gathered together to look at global problems around the world and how we might solve them. Hopefully sooner than later, but they'll take whatever time they will. And as we look at these problems, I'm reminded of a quotation by Joseph Campbell. He said, we, we are here to learn to go with joy among the sorrows of the world. Now that sounds callous. That sounds unfeeling on the face of it, doesn't it? How can you go with joy among the sorrows of the world with all the problems we have, all the things to be concerned about? But I ask you this, does it do the world any good for us to walk around like this, with the weight of the world on our shoulders, with a long face, that doesn't do the world any good. 
We're here to bring joy into every interaction we do. Not necessarily to feel happy. I can't control how I feel moment to moment. But I can control what I do more. I don't ask people to feel compassionate. I don't ask you to feel courageous or confident or peaceful or happy or loving. I only ask you to behave that way. And this takes a warrior spirit to behave with kindness and compassion, whether or not you happen to feel that way. This is my practice. So we're here to learn to solve problems. There's another quotation. How, uh, how many of you have heard of Aldous Huxley, the writer? He wrote a book. The English title is Brave New World. I don't know the title in Espanol. Um, but as much as any Westerner, he'd studied the global heritage of spiritual traditions. He practiced them. He didn't just read about them. And when he was near death, he was an older man, his good friend Houston Smith, who was an expert on world religions, said, Aldous, after all the years of study you've done, and all the spiritual traditions, religious traditions, can you somehow summarize what you've learned? And Professor Huxley said, I'm a little embarrassed to say, I can probably summarize it all in about six words. Try to be a little kinder. Kindness, loving kindness in our relationships. We can talk about saving the world, but how is your relationship doing? In business, personal relationships. When I mentioned that we've all gone through adversity, how many of you have done any kind of sports or musical training? Anyone here done some sports? That's a form of voluntary adversity. It's like life, but more so. You encounter self-doubt, you encounter ups and downs, and have to struggle. And you learn about life through that activity. How many of you have maintained a relationship for more than two years? Voluntary adversity. Of course, relationships can be wonderful, but also they have their challenges. It took me 25 years to realize my dear wife, Joy, was not criticizing me, she was improving me. Relationships have their challenges. How many of you have raised children? Anybody here? Voluntary adversity. People ask me sometimes, why does life have to be so difficult? And I say, oh, would you like life to be easier? I'll tell you how to do that. Don't get married. Don't have children. Don't go into business or take on any responsibility at all, and life will be a little simpler. But I ask you, are we here for easy? Is that what we were born for? Granted, through intelligence, we can make life a little easier and get out of our own way. But life on planet Earth is a form of spiritual weightlifting to strengthen our spirits. That's why I think it was St. Augustine who said, he prayed, he said, Lord, I pray not for a lighter load, but for stronger shoulders. And this is part of the peaceful warrior's way as well. And these are the reminders that we're all aware of, but I'm expressing them in this way. Now, it's fine to say try to be a little kinder, but it takes wisdom to know how to be kind. It takes preparation. You may have seen in the movie, there was a scene in the movie that I actually got into the movie at the last minute. And what really happened was Socrates, the man I describe who was in the movie or in my books, um, we were walking down the street and I was doing a great deal of work on myself. And I noticed a poster about starving people and oppressed people and children who were working at very young ages and all the problems of the world. And I said, Socrates, I feel guilty, I feel selfish doing all this work on myself when there's so many people in need out there. And that's when he turned to me and said, take a swing at me. I'll give you $5 if you can slap me on the cheek. Come on. 
I thought it was some kind of test. So I finally took a swing at him, and I found myself on the ground in a rather painful wrist lock. And as he let me up to my feet, he said, do you notice a little leverage can be very effective? And I said, yes, I noticed. He said, well, if you want to help people, he said, that's wonderful, go with your heart. But he said, don't ignore the necessity to know yourself, to develop the wisdom and the courage to know how to exert the right leverage at the right place, at the right time. And this is what my colleagues and I, the distinguished panelists, are all doing. And this is what you'll be doing, is finding out, gaining the wisdom to exert the right leverage at the right place, at the right time. It's not enough to want to do good. There are people who are young and idealistic and they run out and they hug trees or they'll sit in trees so they won't get cut down. They make wonderful gestures, but maybe later they become cynical because the world isn't listening to them. They haven't done the necessary preparation. Let me share one of my favorite movies. You know, it's not Guerrero Pacifico. It's not. The movie is called Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day in English. I think the translator has the title. In España, it's Atrado en el Tiempo. Yeah. Do you remember that movie? Anybody see that movie? It's one of the most spiritual movies you'll ever see. The cynical man, selfish, unaware, goes, you know, day after day, for those who haven't seen the movie. Every day is the same. He wakes up, whatever happens, it's six in the morning, the same day. He lives the same day over and over. And first he takes advantage of it in this way or that. He gets money, robs a, something, and he, because it gives him power. But eventually he becomes so depressed that he's never going to get out of it. He loses his ways, looking for meaning. And he tries to, he kills himself time and time again, but he keeps waking up at six o'clock every morning. Not even that works. So then he begins to study. He becomes a doctor. He becomes a master of the piano. Because each day he remembers. It repeats itself over and over, but he remembers. So he becomes very capable in many areas. And the end is all that's left is service. That's all that he can do is to give to other people. But in the meantime, he's prepared himself. He saves a life because he studied medicine. He did the preparation. He gained the wisdom to know how to exert the right leverage at the right place and at the right time. So, I want to say there are two schools of thought in the world today. The idealist school and the realist school. And sometimes we'll hear that up on a panel. You see, some people tend to be more idealistic and some more what we call realistic. Inside, there are the, inside us, there is a realist and an idealist. Ideals are what we're striving towards. The purpose of religion and spiritual practice is to call us up to our highest ideals. But if the world were full of only idealists, we'd have one failed utopian experiment after another because they wouldn't be so practical. The danger in just idealistic theories is we could be this becomes we should be this. And sometimes we get dictators, absolutists, who say it has to be this way, imposed on a populace that isn't ready for it. Now, if this world were populated only by realists, we'd get a lot of things done because they acknowledge how things are, not just looking at how they could be. But that can become a more cynical, pragmatic, yes, but cynical, Machiavellian world. Only realists, never looking up to see what's possible, what we can rise to. So we need both in this world. One isn't better than the other. It's just good to recognize that. So we need to be idealists and see that, but also be realistic in what we can do right now. And some of the panelists referred to that. 
I'd like to end with two more things, and then I'm going to invite uh, Juan to ask me some questions that you might have as well. Um, first of all, there's a story of a, ma- uh, a woman who was standing on a beach, and there were h- hundreds, maybe thousands of starfish that had been washed up by a storm onto the shore, and they were drying out, and they were going to be dying. And the woman was bending over. She was an older woman, but she was bending over, picking up a starfish and throwing it back in the water. And then she bent over and picked up another starfish and threw it back in the water. And someone came up to her and said, there are thousands of these. You can't save these starfish. And she said, I can save this one. So maybe we can save one person There's a young man in Africa, my wife and I put through college, we'd never met him, but we made contact with him, and he grew up in a tiny village in Embu region, in Kenya, and we put him through four years of college, we were able to do that. We actually borrowed money to put him through his fourth year, Um, and he's an accountant now, and he's married, they just had a baby, so this is one life. So it's good to dream big, but start small and then connect the dots. First, prepare yourself, and then we can do something. There are leaders here today, or you wouldn't be here if you didn't have that impulse to leadership. There are leaders here today, and the best way I know of to lead is by example. Albert Schweitzer once said, in influencing other people, Example is not the main thing. It's the only thing. There's a story about Gandhi. Uh, A mother brought her son to Gandhi and said, please tell my son to stop eating so much white sugar. It's not good for him. And Gandhi, he'll listen to you. And so Gandhi turned to the boy and, and the mother and he said, come back in two weeks. So they left and they came back in two weeks Gandhi turned to the boy and said, first thing, don't eat so much white sugar, it's not good for you. And she said, well, thank you, Mahatma, for telling him this, but why did you wait two weeks? And he said, oh, two weeks ago, I was eating white sugar. (laughs) So this this story conveys, really, to live our own life. Uh, Yesterday, when I arrived here, I saw some litter on the street, and I picked it up and put it in a trash can. If I see some litter, I pick it up. It's not a big deal. It's, I can't know the impact of my words, but I do know when I leave Madrid, it's going to be a little bit cleaner. So these are little things we can do that can make a big difference over time. A kind word to someone. This is what helps our environment and it helps the world as well. This is within our control. We can control our efforts in this world. We can't control the outcomes. But by making a good effort, we increase the odds of getting the desired results. Isaac Bathsheba Singer said, life is God's novel. Let God write it. But meanwhile, we can do our part to, uh, in our families, in our environment, just to do our best and to be kind to ourselves, to support ourselves in the work we do, to get a little exercise every day, to eat a balanced diet, to get enough rest. That's taking care of ourselves so we can take care of the world even better. Well, those were the main thoughts I wanted to share with you, um, and perhaps we can do some questions. I love questions. Also, after we're done here, it'll be time for lunch. Tengo hambre. Um, Then, uh, after lunch, I'm going to be sitting outside. If anyone wants to come up, say hello or has a question, I'll be available for a little while after lunch. So uh, it's been a wonderful connection, but we're not done yet. Let's uh, uh, do some questions and answers now. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, a lo largo de la película y en tu mensaje, siempre intentas que la gente esté despierta. En ocasiones los individuos despertamos con un accidente, con la muerte de un ser querido, con algún fracaso. Pero eso se va con el tiempo. ¿Cómo mantenernos despiertos 
durante toda nuestra vida. Yes, staying awake. Uh, there is a story of a wanderer in the forest centuries ago uh, in India, and he came across the Buddha, and he didn't know who this person was, but he was fascinated with him. So he walked alongside the Buddha and finally got enough nerve to ask him, are you a wizard? And the Buddha said, no, no. He said, are, are you a warrior or a king? And Buddha said, no. And the man said, but what is it that makes you different from anyone I've ever met? And Buddha smiled at him and said, oh, he said, I'm awake. And that's what attracted me to that old man in the gas station. He, was, he had something I didn't. He had an understanding that life is a game. We play as if it matters. But he had a transcendental view, too. We live in two worlds. And there's the conventional world, where we will lose everyone we ever love. This is a world of friction and gravity and death. But there is a transcendental, a higher truth, another world that we also connect, can connect with. And this is the, one of the greatest spiritual disciplines of living with our head in the clouds, but our feet on the ground, of recognizing we need to function in this world fully. This is what we have. But remember the transcendent. Some people, through religion, they remember the transcendent, the divine possibilities, the bigger picture of life. And then when these things happen to us, losses, challenges, we don't have to pretend to like them, but we take them in stride, recognizing this is part of our process, part of our life. ¿Qué necesitamos más? ¿Un Sócrates en nuestra vida o un coche donde subirnos a descubrir las verdades por nosotros mismos? Hmm. Well, I don't personally believe we have to drive around the world to find the truth. I think it's right at home where we live. We all have access to it. Um, there is a saying some people have heard that when the student is ready, the teacher appears, the right teacher for them. Many people misunderstand this, thinking when they're somehow deserving or ready, this teacher like Socrates will walk into their life and, and tell them the secrets they need to know. I believe when the student is ready, that means they're paying attention and open. Then the, the teacher appears everywhere, not just across the world or in the East or in an old gas station, but our friends, our adversaries, everyone in our lives can teach us. Daily life is a school. Lessons repeat themselves until we learn them. Hablando, perdón, hablando de maestros, se dice que el buen maestro es aquel que te enseña a no necesitarle. ¿Quién, quién, es, quién es peor, el maestro que genera dependencia o el alumno que depende del maestro? important question. I often remind people that I'm not here for you to trust me. I'm here to help you trust yourself. This is so important. It, it's not that we shouldn't listen to the counsels of the wise and the experienced, but it is their experience. And it's been said that the only people who profit from the experience of others are biographers. So we also need to trust our own heart to check out whatever we hear from any other teacher against our inner knower. So the best teachers, whether they're teaching a subject, mathematics, the environment, literature, history, the best teachers are teaching life through the subject, not just the subject. Broader principles of understanding ourselves. And a, a true teacher is a bridge we walk over. My goal has always been for my students to surpass me And that's uh, what I always hope for, for you. En la película hay un accidente. Yo hace mucho tiempo pensaba que solo se aprendía por sufrimiento. Pero escuchando a un ponente dice que hay dos formas de aprender, por sufrimiento y por curiosidad. ¿Cuál es más potente y más útil? 
Mm, very good question, and I think you know the answer to that one. I know what you think. <laughs> um, what do you think? Uh, it, well, it seems to me that some kind of adversity or stress that puts us up against ourselves, that helps us to see ourselves, can be useful. Um, I, I did suffer a shattered right thigh bone. I broke my leg quite badly, as shown in the movie and in my book on which the movie is based. And it changed my life. It shook me up, upward. I started asking bigger questions about life. I became more serious in a good way. But I do not recommend fractures as a method of personal or spiritual growth. If we can learn the easy lessons, that's much better. And the more sensitive and aware we are, the easier we can learn the lessons we need about life. Uh, we don't have to learn the harder ones. ¿Cuánto, ¿Cuánta basura mental tenemos y por qué la permitimos? Yes, in the movie, there's the line, take out the trash, and Socrates is referring to what's going on in Dan's head. It's generally accepted, people who study meditation, that somehow we're supposed to quiet our mind and get rid of all those bothersome, distracting, and often unpleasant thoughts. When we start to introspect and notice how the discursive mind uh, bubbles up like a hot springs, of course, we use the mind for wonderful things, for poetry, for solving mathematics, uh, for improving our world. Uh, the mind is a wonderful tool, but the discursive mind bubbling up, we, many of us don't like that. We don't like to sit or stand in line somewhere and have the mind going blah, 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 blah. And yet, the highest way to transcend the mind is not by struggling to get rid of thoughts, I don't think we have a, a, a filter to stop a thought that we don't want to think about. Is to accept our thoughts as natural to us in the moment. Sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes not. Sometimes we worry. It's part of life. It's more realistic, I think. So to accept the mind and focus on what we need to do in the moment, rather than try to quiet our mind and find self-esteem and find our focus and visualize positive outcomes so that we can develop the confidence to find the determination, to make the commitment to do whatever it is we need to do. Rather, we can just do it. It's much less complicated. That's not always easy, but that's why we're here to develop a warrior spirit. Una de las escenas que ha tenido mayor repercusión o siempre tiene al ver la película es la de la piedra. La felicidad la aporta el viaje, no el destino. ¿Por qué no somos capaces de disfrutar del viaje? Entiendo que de, de pequeño somos una grabadora que nos mete mucha información, pero hay una, un momento de madurez donde uno tiene que discernir lo, lo, que, lo que le está afectando o cómo ve la realidad, cómo despertar y empezar a disfrutar del camino. Thank you. I've been asked, uh, am I pr process or product oriented? Do you just go for the goal and focus on that? Or do you enjoy step by step? Um, all of you have either played golf or seen the game of golf, for example. And many golfers, they enjoy swinging and hitting the ball and making the putt, their minds focused, but they don't enjoy the in-between. They forget to enjoy the walk to the neck, to the ball. They forget to enjoy how much fun it is driving those carts. So this is the importance of enjoying the process because if your goal is to climb a mountain, then by definition, you failed to reach the top every step of the way until you get that one success. But if you define every step as success, moving in the right direction, then you have many successes. And then you can enjoy the process. Margaret Bonanno, a writer, once said, we can only live happily ever after on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Life is a series of moments. Um, I've never met a neurotic person, 
not even Woody Allen. I've only met people who have more neurotic moments. I've never met an intelligent person. I've only met people who have more intelligent moments. I've had some intelligent moments. I've also had some pretty stupid ones. You could ask my daughters, they'll tell you. Um, so it's focusing on this moment. That's what counts. The rest is illusion, imagination of the future or memory impressions of the past. This is the moment of power. This is the moment of truth, what is happening in front of us. Ah, en que somos una máquina del tiempo, del pasado al futuro y del, de, del futuro al pasado. Eso genera deseos y genera miedo. Para terminar, sobre todo porque el presente nos dice que hay hambre, eh, tres consejos para vivir en presente. First, let's acknowledge we don't really like the present. Most of us would rather be in the past or future because that's where we spend most of our time. The past and future are nice places to visit. We can plan our day, anticipate, think ahead of a pleasant experience. We can remember the past with nostalgia, no problem. They're nice places to visit, but we don't want to live there. If you'd like to have a quieter mind, Focus on the present, because you can't think about anything in this moment. In this moment, there's only pure awareness. As soon as we think about something, we're thinking about something that's already happened or we think is going to happen, and it rarely turns out exactly that way. But we're, we tend to not think this present moment is enough. Um, when you're eating a meal, how many of us, when we're eating, we're eating and talking with someone? We're eating and reading a book or the newspaper, we hardly know what we're eating. I do this sometimes too, but if we could just sit and the moment were enough. Now let me say, suggest a way to do that. Uh, Socrates and I were in the gymnasium, and I, I, was, I was doing a dismount from the horizontal bar, I, a double somersault with twists, and I stuck my landing. I landed without moving, which is a good thing in gymnastics. And I went, yes! And then I pulled off my sweatshirt, stuffed it into my workout bag, and we were walking down the hallway. Workout was over. And Socrates turned to me and said, you know that last move you did, Dan, was really sloppy. And I said, what do you mean? That was the best dismount I did in dos semanas. And he said, I'm not talking about the dismount. I'm talking about the way you took off your sweatshirt and pushed it into your workout bag. He reminded me again that I was treating one moment as special, flying through the air, and another moment as ordinary. But again, he said, there are no ordinary moments. But to realize this and to practice it, that is the challenge. That is the challenge. And he said one more thing, and this might be a good place to close in terms of our time. I don't know, it's up to you, Juan. But he said, the difference between us, Dan, and I got this line into the movie as well at the last minute. The difference between us is you practice gymnastics, I practice everything. Now, what is that about? Well, most of the time we're doing things. Every day, we're doing things. After this finishes, you'll stand up and walk up the steps. You're doing that. We do the dishes. We clean the dishes. We do the laundry. We do our schoolwork. We're doing things. But how many of us are practicing? You see, when you practice, you repeat something with the idea of improving it. How many of us are working on improving our breathing? Improving doing the dishes? Improving how we sign our name? Most of us just do. We don't practice. As we begin to practice everything we do, Speaking, walking, breathing. It's not some compulsive, obsessive, never-ending self-improvement project. It just embraces life more deeply. We become more absorbed, like a young child. You know how they can be. By practicing, and this is how we come back to the present. We bring our attention back, remembering this is not an ordinary moment. 
Si me permiten, por, por tiempo que tenemos que irnos, dos preguntas eh, que nos ha dado el público. Ante la situación económica que vivimos, ¿usted cree que los mandatarios necesitan un Sócrates en su vida? ¿Y los altos cargos de las entidades financieras? Very, very good question. Um, I'm so glad you brought that up to bring it back to the theme of this gathering. There are real issues to solve, um, and we will solve them or we will not, and we will have the consequences. See, the peaceful warrior's way is about universal law, not my opinions or your opinions. Universal law is not about moral ideas. It's about action and consequences. To tell people that's wrong and that's right hasn't emptied our prisons. But if people understood the consequences of their actions in the environment, on other people, we would more likely change and the populace can become educated. The law of gravity, if I drop this, we know what's going to happen. It's going to fall toward the earth. That law, you know, if you ignore the law of gravity, it doesn't make you a bad or evil person. But if you're skydiving or rock climbing, it just might make you dead. So again, it's not about moralistic ideas. It's about action and consequences. And this is what we're going to have to recognize. And we need people in our financial institutions who are aware, who have good heart, who are committed to kindness. It's not always easy. But if, if people who are committed to life's bigger picture and giving and service only go in certain occupations. We need them in every occupation. So I think this is very important for young people waking up. This is going to exert the leverage. Our institutions will change. I'm one small voice through my books and my speaking and other voices here. But they help us wake up like the Buddha and we become more effective to exert the right leverage in those real problems we face in the world. I hope that responds to the question. Última pregunta. ¿Por qué crees que las personas tienen miedo a mirar en su interior? Mm. Many of us are afraid to look inside because we're afraid of what we'll see. How many of you, through a difficulty in relationship, uh, have seen parts of yourself that you're not too fond of. Many of us have. Relationships are a form of working with our shadow. Carl Jung, the noted psychoanalyst, said, enlightenment isn't just about seeing luminous shapes and visions. It's about making the darkness visible. In one of my books, I, talk, I write about 12 areas of life uh, that constitute personal growth. And one of those 12 areas is illuminating our shadow, is knowing ourselves, is seeing ourselves, those, the bright side and the not so bright side, accepting ourselves as we are. If we don't know ourselves truly, often we just have a self-image. The more authentic we become, the more open we become, the better decisions we make about who to spend our lives with, about the work we're going into, our calling, our career, we make wiser choices. If we don't know ourselves, we make, may make a good choice for the wrong person that we thought we were. So this is a very important area to come to know ourselves and be realistic. And then we can again have more impact in the world. Dan, muchas gracias por estas reflexiones. My pleasure. Gracias por las preguntas que han hecho llegar y nos ponemos ahora mismo a practicar gimnasio. Vale. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias.